get started. Hi everyone, this is Bonnie Weddle. I'm the coordinator of the Electronic Records Unit at the New York State Archives and the co-chair of the COSA State Electronic Records Initiative's Education and Programming Subcommittee. Welcome to today's webinar, Preserving Digitized State Government Records. This webinar is part of COSA and Preservica's joint 2016-2017 Practical Digital Preservation Program, which provides training to state archives personnel and to state government IT staff, state CIOs, and state agency records managers. The next webinar, The Governance of Long-Term Information, takes place on May 23rd and is tailored for state government CIOs. It will feature Doug Robinson, the Executive Director of the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, and NACIO has been publicizing it quite intensively. COSA is also sending publicity materials to state and territorial archivists. Please note that this webinar is not limited to state CIOs and that COSA recently expanded the number of registration slots available for all of its webinars. If you anticipate talking with your agency CIO or state CIO at some point in the future, this webinar should furnish you with a host of good talking points. The final webinar in this series, Best Practices in Digital Preservation International Perspectives, takes place on June 9th and will highlight how several European repositories are addressing their digital preservation challenges. Finally, if you're interested in checking out previous practical digital preservation offerings, you'll find links to the slides and recordings for all of them on the COSA website. Simply go to www.statearchivist.org and follow the link on the home page. During today's webinar, we'll be hearing from four people who have extensive experience dealing with the challenges associated with acquiring, preserving, and providing access to digitized state government records. First, we'll hear from Alan Ramsey of the Connecticut State Library. Alan joined the Connecticut State Library staff in 2010 as government records archivist. He became assistant state archivist in 2013 and oversees the acquisition, arrangement, description, and preservation of state and local government records and non-governmental records of enduring value pertaining to the history and heritage of the state of Connecticut. He was appointed a member of the Connecticut State Historical Records Advisory Board in 2017. Alan holds a BA in History from Winona State University, an MA in History from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, and a Master's in Library and Information Science from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He obtained the Society of American Archivists Digital Archives Specialist Certificate in 2013. Next up, we'll have Brian Collars of the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. Brian has worked at the Department of Archives and History for the past 24 years and has held a variety of positions, including stints as Departmental Records Officer, Processing Archivist, Accessions Archivist, Reference Archivist, and Digitization Archivist. He currently serves as the supervisor of the Electronic Records and Imaging Services branches for the department. Uh, currently, he's managing the department's implementation and creation of a trusted digital repository. Brian is a past program chair for the South Carolina Archival Association and a founding member of the South Carolina Digital Library Committee and continue, continues to serve on the South Carolina Digital Library Advisory Board. Then we'll hear from Vince Brooks of the Library of Virginia. Vince is a senior local records archivist at the Library of Virginia, which is the Commonwealth State, Ar State Library and State Archives. In 18 years with the agency, Vince has held various positions, including reference archivist and architectural records archivist. Currently, he helps to oversee the indexing and digitization of local chancery court suits, many of which date to the early 18th century. Vince received his BA in History from St. Vincent College and an MA in Archival Museum and Historical Editing Studies from Duquesne University. And David Portman of Preservica will wrap things up. David joined the Preservica team at the start of 2016 to promote awareness and education uh, relating to digital preservation. Uh, prior to working with Preservica, he helped global organizations transform the management of information technology assets, services, expenses, and usage. And here's the roadmap for today's webinar. Alan's going to be furnishing an overview of best practices for managing digitization projects and discussing COSA's forthcoming digitization best practices guidelines. Brian will detail how the South Carolina Department of Archives and History dealt with a quote unquote meta mess, a jumble of reuse, re reuse resistant metadata that accompanied a transfer of electronic records. Vince will highlight the lessons that the Library of Virginia learned as it uh, pursued its digital chancery project. And finally, David is going to offer some advice regarding the technical aspects of acquiring, preserving, and providing access to digitized records. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Alan. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, we but yeah, today I'm going to talk about best practice for digitization project management. 
Um, uh, just a quick overview. In uh, as most of you know, 2011, the State Electronic Records Initiative of the Council of State Archivists began and focused on challenges of electronic records management and preservation. Uh, the Tools and Resources Subcommittee uh, has identified a need for guidance documents for providing best practices, uh, or identified a need for digitization uh, 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 best practices management guide guidance as one thing because you know most of our states we have uh, an agency or an office who let's just run up to the scanner and scan everything and not sort of think through is that really what we should be doing? Um, we discussed you know. Uh, you know, the, the effort to go paperless. And guidance documents, well, geared towards our audience, the archives and records management programs, so the basic principles apply to any level of, of state or local government or, or even, you know, other other entities, cultural heritage organizations. Uh, an overview of the best practice is broken into four broad categories, uh, pre-project planning, uh, project preparation, project management, and post-project. Each category includes strategies and best practices of a successful digitization project. So pre-project, and I'm gonna go through each of these very, you know, sort of at high level, but uh, pre-project planning is often documented in a project plan, or you may hear the term charter or, or some other sort of term of the document. And it's doc, as it says, you know, documenting the, the, the project uh, the very basic foundation of any digitization project is its purpose. Uh, you know, why is this project being done now, and why is it, you know, why is the project being done now, being done, and why is it being done now? Uh, you know, various reasons, you know, to create efficiencies, or the, the, you know, often we're moving, so we're losing our storage space, so we want to kind of reduce our paper, or, you know, we have a commemoration coming up, you know, like World War I, uh, so we want to kind of commemorate something. Um, those are just a few examples, uh, or you know, you have a back file conversion, taking a completely paper process and trying to transform it into a hopefully better and improved electronic process, if you know, electronic process if done correctly. Uh, and the foundation of your of the project will be built upon always should be built upon three the three basic questions of what do you have, so what are the resources you have, or the type of material you have, is it audio visual, is it paper, is it something else? Uh, what are you trying to do? Um, you know, so what is exactly the, you know, is this to make access, is this for preservation? Um, and, and you know, why are you doing it? You know, create efficiencies or, hey, we want to show something really cool to our, uh, to our uh, users or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, you're going to want to identify your stakeholders. Uh, and, you know, especially executive stakeholders, because they'll be able to uh, provide valuable input and insulate the project from changing institutional priorities and budgets, because changes happen and they happen a lot. So if you can get some insulation in between you and those changes, uh, stakeholder buy-in, both at the executive level and then your users as well. Uh, you know, is this really going to work for them or why are you doing it? Uh, you know, and then, of, of course, there's always the looming budget estimates and costs, uh, you know, you need to understand those going forward with your, before you go forward with your digitization project. It's also uh, important to understand how much the project will cost. You know, think about, also think about staff time, time to organize and prepare the materials, you know, process them. Are you going to do an outside vendor in-house sort of thing? Um, you know, are you going to go for grants and there's certain cost share requirements with grants, um, and things of that nature. Risks, because every project has risks, and you're going to want to document those up front in the pre-project planning. What are those risks that you see coming forward? Do you have the appropriate metadata, or do you not have any metadata? That, that could be a risk. Um, and you need to address those and try to minimize those risks, uh, which is essential to the project management task, um, and, and really should not be overlooked. Um, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, you're going to want to mitigate those risks. Well, so it's sort of planning, okay, we're going to be taking the files from, uh, or records from a fairly secure area and we're going to be moving them to a digitization area and sort of how, how are we going to mitigate those risks. Um, specifications, I'm not going to talk too much about this because there are way too many of them out there. 
I would suggest, you know, please visiting the PERT portal uh, from the COSA website, which you can find a lot of these technical guidelines in there, and also the uh, federal agency's digital uh, guidelines initiative, the FAGI guidelines. Uh, they are very technical, but they are very useful. Uh, and then, you know, to keep up with most, sort of the most recent professionally accepted standards for all for all different types of formats. Uh, and then implementation, so talking about, you know, in-house versus outsource. You have the resources to do it in-house, and that kind of goes back to cost. Do you have the equipment? Do you have the staff time? Or do you, are you going to outsource it to a vendor? Um, what does that look like? You may have to go through state, con well, in most cases, you probably have to go through state contracting, and how does that all look and uh, work and, and things to think about there, and then working with a vendor and having them actually come in, or, you know, even in some projects here, we, we go out and we actually visit the vend you know, uh, the vendor site to actually see where are they going to store the records and how are they going to handle the records and, um, and they should be coming back to you with, you know, depending on your um, uh, practices in your various areas, they should be coming back to you with what, you know, costs and estimates and, uh, and that may already be built into contracting, but, um, you know, don't ever feel like you can't, you know, necessarily go to a vendor depending on your situation. Um, they'll probably be more than willing to kind of walk you through sort of their process well, um, that should all go into your pre-project planning. And then getting to project planning, so preparing the records, um, you know, physical preparation. So, you know, is it going to be a, sort of an automatic sort of you feed the paper through, or is it going to be you're going to put on a flat uh, a flat scanner? So, what are you going to need to do to kind of do that? And you may need to remove paper clips and and you know, staples and things like that. And same thing for vendors, and they're gonna, that's of course gonna have a cost to it. Um, so you need to kind of go through that and see how that, you know, how that all should work, and that should be into your project planning. Um, arrangements, so how are the records organized? Uh, you know, so in archival terms, we talk about arrangements, but you know, in the office, how are they organized, and, and for how are we gonna keep that going forward? Uh, and how are you going to want to, you know, have that order for your digitization? Are you going to break it into chunks? I mean, we're doing a project right now where we're sort of breaking things into chunks to send off to a vendor. Um, you know, and then of course you have description available, or there's some, or the, you're going to need to key in things as you're going along for metadata. Um, you know, uh, you know, gathering information about the collection, the series, and all those sorts of things, or the files. Um, and then, of course, for packaging and shipping. So is it going to be in-house? Is it going down to the digitization area? And is there a pipe running over? What are the, again, that gets back to risk and trying to mitigate the risks. Um, you know, and, uh, or are they going to be shipped out? So we had a project where we shipped out, uh, an agency shipped out architectural drawings. So we put them into protective plastic sort of bags to keep, you know, in case there's ever a water thing, uh, keep that sort of at bay. Uh, as an example, I mean, just a general example. Um, and of course, understanding the shipping costs and building that back into sort of your costs um, to transfer those records around. Um, and, uh, you know, also getting receipts as things move along. So, you know, a vendor brought stuff back to us, we're signing off that we received a shipment and then we checked off against a manifest. So, and that's very important to so kind of know, did you get everything back? because uh, you want to get everything back. Um, and then, you know, staffing, you know, really, uh, as it says there, you should have a project manager uh, with some experience with project management or experienced staff member. Uh, the project manager should be, a, you know, a strong, detail-orientated, efficient uh, staff member uh, who is capable of directing the overall program, making sure things are moving along, that progress is being made. Um, you know, that they're, uh, you know, this is not, I can't stress this highly enough, that this is not a responsibility they can necessarily just tack on to a staff member to do um, because they really need to be focused on this and not doing so many different other things. You know, they may have a few projects uh, going on, but you really sort of want them focused in on, on the project at hand. And you may need additional in-house staff. Uh, uh, you know, in addition to the manager, other staff members, you know, such as folks, if you're doing it in-house, to do this digitization itself, to do the quality control, to do the metadata, all those sorts of things. And then communication. 
beyond having a project manager, they need to be able to communicate with, with the, you know, if it's in-house with the staff and uh, also communicating to users if need be or to, you know, or definitely to the stakeholders on sort of where things stand or if it's a vendor sort of, you know, where things are at or if something happens, not, you know, being afraid to pick up the phone and say what's going on here um, and sort of working through those issues. And then post-digitization project management. How will you manage the originals? Are they coming back? Are they going to go into storage? And the digitized, the digitized versions are going to be the access copies, or you know, or in the case of some agencies, I know here if it's less than permanent, they're able to scan and put in for disposition authorization to destroy. Is that what's going to happen? And then. Um, you know, and then what's going to happen with the digital copies? You know, where are they going to be stored? What's the storage cost? And now you're starting to get into that, what's my long-term sustainability, which goes throughout sort of the planning phases. And then finally, you know, you get to the day where you've laid out your plan, you've reviewed it, you've, you've sort of got to the place where you, where you think it's, you know, it's ready to go, so now the day has come to implement it. How do you actually manage it, manage the thing? Um, you know, you know. Again, signing a single person or a very small group to oversee the project. You know, project manager. Um, you know, for the coordination of the communication between the various parties, uh, progress reporting, maintaining timetables, resolving questions and minor issues, and all those sorts of things. Um, you know, logistics of getting things around. Um, you know, for, you know whether it consists of a few dozen items to thousands of items. Um, you know, who has custody of the items at what point and what time, those sorts of things. Um, and then workflow and procedures. So, you know, communication, uh, you know, again, very key, trying to communicate where, you know, in the process of where things should be at. Uh, descriptions of, uh, you know, who's going to be doing the metadata work. Um, and you're going to want to be detailed and, and, and very explicit in the instructions and specifications of digitization. Uh, as we say in the document, make no assumptions. So if you think somebody's going to do something, you better write down what you're sort of wanting them to do and to work through that. So maybe sort of bouncing off, of, you know, doing some test runs. Does this work? And if not, going back and revising it before you sort of set the final workflow. And then, of course, the uh, you know, ever big thing, quality control and quality assurance. And, uh, you know, going through and, you know, I scanned 12 items, well, that's pretty easy to kind of do quality control. I scanned, you know, 2,000, well, in that case, you may want to do a sample and take every 10th or 20th item or a couple samples to, to see in each batch what's going on. Um, and, and even if you have a vendor do it, when you get the files back, you should do some, some quality control. Otherwise, you know, they could be sending you back uh, JPEGs when you said you wanted TIFFs. And so if you don't catch that and you pay for it, then you're really in, in kind of in a, uh, not, not in a good spot. Um, or an example which happened uh, here, you know, we scanned about 200 photographs and we didn't realize the scanner settings were the right way and so they were darker than they should be and so we had to go back and scan all 200 and you really don't want to have to do that. So um, kind of checking as you're going along. Um, and post project, counting, you know, the, the, you know, you know, how successful was the project overall, counting for the cost of the project, sort of, you know, documenting all those costs. Um, you know, how much resources were used? Did you buy new equipment? What were the cost shares if it's a grant? Um, you know, what sort of lessons did you learn? And, and think, think about some of the some questions like, you know, did the uh, management of the project go well? Was there something that could have been done better? Uh, was the project successful? Um, can we tell if access to materials have been improved or not? Questions like that. And so that should go into a sort of, you know, not, you know, in grants, you usually have interim reports and a final report, but you really should put, be putting together a final, final report and documentation, um, and also in, those, in there, you know, making your recommendations, you know, we need to sustain these, so we need storage costs, and we're going to need to migrate them in the future, and there's going to be a cost to that, and sort of starting to build those long-term 
access preservation and all those sorts of costs into it. And coming very soon, we're almost done, uh, best practice digitization project management document, which will be available on the first portal, um, which is pictured here in the screenshot. Um, should be coming soon. We're in the final uh, steps of finalizing the document, so that should be out shortly. Um, we're working on a series of best practices and guidance documents, so um, if there are best practices or guidance documents that you would like, that you would find the most helpful or necessary in your work or, you know, something that, gee, this would be really great to, um, something that uh, COSA should put together um, that would help everybody, you know, please let me know. Put it in the chat box if you can think of it right now. We just, I, I, you know, I thought of a really great idea. Um, and um, now I'm going to pass, pass it off to Brian. Well, thank you, David, or excuse me, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Oop, look at that. Uh, I'll be uh, discussing briefly or, uh, uh, over my 10 minutes that I was given to talk about, although I can talk a little bit longer about it. Uh, MetaMess is what I call it, and it's uh, an overview of uh, metadata and electronic records transfer that we received here at the archives give you an indication of just exactly what we're dealing with when we start talking about electronic records and uh, um, metadata that is received. I recall in a situation I call what I call metadata myth conceptions. Back in the mid to, to late 90s when I started working with electronic records and we were still worrying about bitstream preservation, we all, at least I made an assumption that when we got electronic records, when the, uh, our institutions started to receive electronic records, the metadata and the records themselves would be in some sort of arrangement or that would make them easily accessible. That's right. At least I thought so. But we were wrong, or more importantly, I was wrong in that, in that myth conception. Electronic records are messy, not in the manner in which paper records are messy, but rather in the manner in which they were stored by the individual or an automated system or even a proprietary software suite. As an example, here is a, an example of a, a metadata that I received from our Department of Health and Environmental Control regarding, regarding birth certificates. Uh, each, uh, the highlighted portion there is one line of metadata that relates to an individual record that we received. In some total, we received 60,000 PDF images of birth certificates, which equated to 120,000 lines of text delimited data as the index or the metadata for those records. Um, and I'd say uh, tab delimited, in this instance, they were tilde delimited. So how do you go from this particular example of metadata that relates to an individual record in this instance, a birth certificate to an XML file that will is readable in machines and especially readable in our preservation system. Uh, we use Preservica here. So how do you uh, create an XML file that relates to the individual entry that we wanted to uh, preserve in uh, Preservica and make it uh, usable so that you could search on a, birth, a person's birth date, uh, or their name or where they were born at or even their mother's name and get a relevant hit back out of, uh, out of the index or out of the system to get you to the record you want, which ultimately is what our patrons and researchers want is they want to go to the system you're using, type in a name or uh, something else and get back a relevant hit. So in this particular instance, and here's an example of a birth certificate. In fact, it's a birth certificate for the, uh, the the highlighted uh, metadata I just showed you. Uh, this is actually an affidavit or a correction to a birth certificate, but uh, the concept is still the same. So how do you go from that tilde delimited text file to an XML file that's represented here? And in this particular instance, I, I came up with a 12-step process is to convert the delimited text file in, into an individual XML file. And there are 12 steps that I used and with a variety of tools. And those tools are, these tools are pretty much on everybody's desktop for the most part. I used uh, Microsoft Excel, um, Access, 
Word, Notepad, Notepad++, GSplitter, which is a text file splitter, which will um, highlight a, or look for a string of text and split it into a new file every time it runs into that highlighted text um, file. And then Bulk Rename Utility, which is a small uh, freeware program that allows you to um, change file names and, um, and folders and things like that. So essentially the process is that we had to import the text delimited file into Excel to put it into columns based upon the tilde or the, the, uh, tab delim the tabs in the tab delimited file. Regulate the data there to make sure that we had uh, particular columns and rows with uh, not only the, the supplied metadata but also uh, added metadata that we wanted to add in, such as uh, our institution, what series number it was in our institution here, uh, and that sort of stuff. Then it was imported out of Excel into Access to regulate uh, the actual file structure, the way that the metadata related to the, uh, the images. And then once in, a in Access, we exported that file into a huge one to an XML file out of Access that uh, was just one huge XML file. At that point, I put it back into Word to take out certain things that uh, Excel and the tab and the text file had put in, such as ampersands, which don't actually read as and, but read as a, a string of code that interferes with XML. So once we got it into Word and we did find and replace about 50 times there to get rid of uh, hidden characters and things like that in the file, put it into, uh, uh, pulled it back out of Word into Notepad++ to check for uh, consistency's sake. And then we used GSplitter to split it on the uh, the closing tag of the SCDH over header, which then created 60,000 individual XML files, uh, which we then used to tie into the actual image and uh, import into Preservica. So it was a, a laborious process to, to actually do all that. The first time, um, some of the lessons we learned was there, even though I had 60,000 individual images, it was easier to deal with them in about 10,000 uh, piece groups rather than trying to do all 60,000. If you've ever tried to parse uh, 60,000 lines of code, and uh, Word, it, it takes a while. You sit there for 10 minutes thinking, is it doing anything? But it's actually working and it's churning real hard, but it takes a while for all that stuff to process, even in the find and replace mode. Um, so dealing in smaller increments worked well. We actually uh, dealt with them. And uh, so we had one year birth certificates come on and we took them on a monthly basis and did all the birth certificates for a particular month and imported those into Preservica at a time. And it creates a nice deliverable unit in, at, at that level. Um, and other things that we learned and, and utilized that we're gonna use when we get the birth certificates this year for 1916 is that uh, the, uh, the metadata is a mess, and until and, and even text delimited files, which are coming out of a, their proprietary system, which has a back end to push it out to a, a non proprietary uh, format for metadata, it, uh, it, it it's still not clean. And sometimes the not only is the metadata not clean, but the uh, the actual records themselves are not clean. Uh, there's errors that creep in in file naming structures. You have to have the, the metadata match the file name of the uh, the object you're, you're importing. So that's uh, that's where the bulk rename utility came in. It allowed us to standardize file names with both the, the uh, digital object we were preserving as well as the metadata. And uh, so those are some of the tools that we used. And so what you end up with after using, utilizing those tools is a, a, an XML um, file is represented here on the left plus the actual digital object. And you marry those two together and you can import them into your, whatever your preservation system is because they're gonna match it on a one-to-one -one basis. And when you have that, you have one happy archivist. And there's my obligatory picture of Mark Myers if you know him and you know me that every time I do a presentation, I put him in there. And so, in lessons learned, metadata may be voluminous and it works best in discrete chunks. You will mess up. It took me, the first time I, I did this, it took three weeks for me to work from the tab delimited file to a, to a uh, 
to the XML file, but once I worked out the steps in the process, you could actually do it in an afternoon. Uh, sometimes it's the data, not the metadata. Your, your data doesn't actually match the, uh, the metadata you received. And no matter how easy a transfer appears to be, it gets complicated real fast. Uh, I'll give two other brief examples. Uh, one was from our judicial department. They sent us metadata out of their system, which was uh, clear and concise XML files. However, what it pointed to was their data was stored in, file, in a file structure that had an overview file folder of one. The folder title was one. Nested within that folder title was 100 folders numbered one through 100. Nested within each one of those folders was another 100 folders numbered one through 100. And then inside each one of those further folders, so we're three, four levels down now, were the actual digital objects that they were preserving. And those in, in turn were titled numbered, excuse me, were numbered one through 100. So each folder had uh, an item level or an item in it told numbered one through 100. It was an entire mess. And even though we had an index that said, well, you need to find object number two. It was which two, and the metadata was unreadable without the proprietary software. Uh, thankfully, that uh, that agency was able to negotiate with their vendor to get it out in a manner that uh, um, was readable in non-proprietary systems, and uh, it's preserved now, at least in-house at that agency. We've yet to actually receive it back from them in a usable manner. The third. Uh, um, example that I'll, I'll mention is the, uh, our governor recently took a position with the, uh, the federal government. She's a new UN ambassador, and uh, for the last three years they've been dealing with uh, the IQ system in terms of managing their incoming correspondence, and uh, they've been scanning all their hard copy stuff and putting it into IQ. And uh, I just recently got a dump of. Uh, 172 gigabytes worth of data from their uh, correspondence files that IQ was kindly, or IQ was uh, kind enough to give me a access database to their, uh, to their, to the electronic correspondence as well as the scan correspondence. So we're in the midst right now of trying to decipher how to pull it back out of access and to create XML files out of it. I've got a hint based on what I've done with the birth certificates. Uh, in terms of how to go about doing that, but we've yet to actually physically do it because there's a number of key, a number of key numbers in the meta, metadata that uh, don't match up to the actual digital dot objects that they scan. So I'm try, trying to decipher that at the moment. But uh, once I do, I'll be more than willing to help, or more than willing to share what we uh, what we did with everybody. So I believe that's the end of my presentation and I will turn it over to Vince if I can get it to advance. There we go. And over to Vince. Hi there. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the Library of Virginia's uh, Digital Chancery Project. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit different in the sense that this is primarily an access project for for paper records. Um, 18th to early 20th century court papers from about 120 Virginia localities. The um, chancery suits are determined in equity rather than by strict common law, so there's a greater narrative uh, through the depositions and things that were filed as part of the cases. So they can be really voluminous um, and, and processing order is important, but there's extensive genealogical, his, historical, uh, uh, local, national, and social history content in them. Um, we began digitizing around the year 2000. Uh, prior to that, we were microfilming for reformatting. Um, right now, we have 70 localities digitized and about 10 million uh, images. Um, actually. It's more like 20 million because we have a, a preservation PDF copy and then a, a JPEG-2 uh, uh, preservation copy. And it's one of the most heavily used digital projects at the library. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of issues that we had during the course of this project just to, to give some practical um, uh, uh, examples. 
the current staff inherited the, the digital project, so some choices were already made, such as uh, the initial vendors and some, some of our processes. Um, and due to the large volume of materials, uh, there were initially 19 localities awarded funding uh, to, to digitize their records. The contract was awarded to, to two separate vendors. Um, after doing a few of those localities, uh, we recognized some inconsistency in the image quality. So um, that, that raised some concerns. Um, it was a variety of issues with uh, proprietary software being used by one vendor, um, varied interpretations of our specifications, um, one particularly um, obdurate vendor, um, and what we had was a high volume of, of rework on these uh, on the scans that were coming back, um, which just is a workflow nightmare with things going out to a vendor coming back and then portions of that going out while a new batch is going out and keeping track of all of those things. Um, so we sat down and and we began to do exactly what should have been done sort of at the at the very beginning in the pre-planning that Alan was talking about. Um, there wasn't a great deal committed to paper before the project began. Um, a lot of our workflows and processes grew out of doing the actual work. Um, and the initial volume, part of that, part of the reason was the initial volume of records was large and the funds were large and everybody saying go, go, go. Um, so the main goal was to get started. Uh, that's why things developed sort of through trial and error. There were many revisions to our statements of work and our internal processes as we went through that. Um, there were lots of answers to questions we didn't even know that we had. And this, unfortunately, in the early years sort of slowed down the project and unnecessarily complicated matters. Um, the solution for the image consistency issues, um, our contract was, well, I should say, shortly before discovering the problems, there was actually a third digital vendor brought on due to the volume of work. Um, and all of our contracts were structured as one-year contracts, renewable each year for up to five years. And there was, there was no penalty for, for non-renewing. Um, there was no guaranteed work. So that set us up well um, because ultimately we let the contracts lapse for the two inconsistent vendors. And uh, in addition to other information, we were able to leverage the image comparison data that we had gathered to support a sole source contract for that, that third vendor. Um, you know, we, we sat down at some point uh, when we began to recognize the inconsistencies, did some comparisons, um, even though they were working from the same specs, the images coming back, uh, some of them had, it was supposed to be lossless, there was loss, uh, you know, there were a, a host of other images, uh, image issues, and we documented all of that, which, which helped us make our case for uh, a sole source. Having that out of the single year contracts made the solution the solution possible and saved us from a, a messier uh, result. Um, the contract structure gave us enough time to evaluate the quality of vendor work, but we didn't have to haggle or pay penalties to end the contract. We just kind of let it wither on the vine and didn't renew. Um, we developed a really good working relationship with that, uh, the vendor that we've gone through uh, as a sole source and we've been working with them for the last eight years. Um, and they're responsible for over half of the digital images that we've produced over the course of this project. Um, I think a big piece of that is that this vendor works with lots of other cultural heritage in institutions and has close connections to the library and archives profession. So they, we spoke the same language. Um, the, the other vendors were um, production houses who did a lot of DOD work, and it was just very, very different, a stack of, you know, modern paper versus, uh, you know, 200-year-old court records. 
um, and I just think there was a, a disconnect there. Um, as far as the workflows, some, some of our, I'll admit some of our process documentation is still lacking, but for the most part, we've worked it all out and written it all down. Um, there are many more professional sources available to review uh, and projects to mimic than, than when we started this. Uh, that forthcoming, those forthcoming COSA guidelines are a good example. Um, that's exactly the kind of document we would have benefited from as we were sitting down to imagine this project. Um, all those things you don't think about thinking about. Um, the lessons learned that we did learn from the Digital Chancery Project have informed other internal and external projects. So it's it's not been a a, a total uh, a totally negative situation as we we've sort of learned um, how to do it better by doing it this way. Um, but the main thing we found is, is being flexible, um, developing as much as your process as you can before you begin the project and, and the best laid plans of mice and men, you know, it, it's never going to work out exactly as you plan it ahead of time. So that flexibility is key um, and really proved uh, beneficial to us as we sort of worked it out on the fly. Uh, but time spent thinking before doing is, is time well spent. Is, um, is kind of the lesson we've, we've taken away. Um, these solutions to these problems, such as they are, um, they worked because we, we documented the, the vendor image problems, which was not so much an issue for working with the vendor or dealing with that particular contract, but it allowed us to make the case for a sole source contract um, with a more uh, amenable vendor. Uh, so that was a, a key piece. Um, we had that contractual out for the, um, the multi-year contracts, one-year contracts, and we had administrative support for a sole source after we could um, show that multiple vendors, some of whom were not always on the same page with us, was not the best way to go. Um, better to do 100 boxes with one vendor than 300 boxes with three vendors, two of whom uh, slow down the process. Um, and when we found that consistent vendor that spoke our language, that really made, it, made a big difference in the efficiency of the project. As far as the workflows, that flexibility and recognizing what we didn't know or haven't thought of and, and going back and addressing that, it, it did have its fits and starts. Um, but, you know, the, the, that vendor, our sole source vendor was very uh, helpful in some of the things that, that Alan mentioned about, you know, the, the manifests and the checkbacks and sharing database information so that they know what they're getting and we know what we're getting back and so on and so forth, um, uh, you know, we, we were able to work that out pretty smoothly with them. Uh, we had good communication between most players internally and we have good communications with the vendor. Um, and actually, uh, shortly after the sole source, we applied for two federal grants, which really uh, forced us to delineate our processes more to explain how we do things and what we were going to do. So going after that grant money forced us to sit down and, and think about and document a lot of these things. Um, if you're undertaking a digital project similar to this, um, consulting any and all best practices or, or similar projects, uh, talking to folks, uh, I can't say, you know, like the, this COSA thing, I had the opportunity to, to read it. Um, and review it a little bit as it was in progress, and it's exactly, like I said, the kind of document we would have benefited from uh, at the, in, back in 2000. Um, speak to those folks with, who've taken on other projects, as I think you've heard here, you know, we're, we're a profession that's willing to share a lot of information. Um, and I think, you know, especially if the project has been completed, you know, if they've done that post-mortem and figured out what's worked and what hasn't worked, uh, those are good folks to talk to. Uh, when you select and convene the project team, 
um, do that early and brainstorm not just the desired outcome, but all of those processes and how you think they might work. Um, they won't work necessarily that way, but a as you uh, think about it, you'll, you'll refine it over time. And the proposed processes need to be reevaluated at various stages as another piece that we found. Um, you know, when you add a new team member or, um, you know, you're, you're piloting a different type of project, like we did some microfilm digital reformatting within this primarily paper project, well, that tweaked our, our processes a little bit. Um, you know, when, when you add on the vendors and their processes and how you all jive that all together, it's a good time along and along to sort of evaluate how it's working. Um, so those are the things that we've learned in, in those particular aspects of, of working on the, the digital chancery project. And I am going to turn it over to David. Okay, thank you very much, Vince. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, running through some kind of technical aspects that you might like to consider uh, when you're working with the digitized content. Um, you kind of look at this as, as considerations that you need to think about and plan for uh, really from the beginning of your project. Um, you know, for example, at the end of the day, you've, you've done a digitization project, you've spent a lot of money, you've invested a lot of time, um, but once you've got that content, where are you going to put all of that digitized content, where it's going to be safe, uh, where it's going to be preserved so it's accessible in the future? Um, and how do you actually intend to use that content? Have you planned for that? Um, and, and do you want it to be accessible um, and accessible in a secure and controlled way? Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, what can you do as part of the process to save you time, uh, save you money, uh, and, and minimize effort and, and resource? So, you know, typically the output of a digitization process um, is going to give you, typically uh, produce multiple versions of the same file. A couple of examples there, high-res TIFF and a low-res JPEG of the same image. Um, now, to simplify the preservation of digitized content, you know, really any good unpack and ingest the entire output of your project. Um, and this really means taking the approach of combining related sets of output files into a single record um, and also associating the, the, good, the good metadata uh, with that record as well. And actually, when you compare this to manually ingesting and preserve, preserving each file and file variant, um, this automated approach is going to save you time and effort. So it's really a consideration uh, for scalability. So Obviously, if you've got a very large project um, running at your organization, you know, this is going to save you time and make your life easier. So you've got your digitized content and, and you've maybe stored it locally. Maybe it's on um, a local network drive or it's, it's on a flash drive. Um, but you need to take it from those, those storage, what we might term as volatile storage, and actually put it into safe and secure storage. Now, this is just an example here that you can see on the screen. It's an example using Amazon Web Services cloud uh, storage. Um, and obviously, with the cloud, you're getting that durability where you've got multiple copies uh, in multiple locations. And there's really two approaches you can take here. Um, so if you're, if you're mid-project, mid-digitization project, and you're seeing in incremental growth in content, say um, on a monthly basis you're, you're getting the, the content from your digitization agency, uh, then you might like to take the approach of using a transfer agent or a SIP transfer uh, to actually upload your content into your preservation system. Um, if you have, uh, now looking at B, if you have a large amount of, of digitized content sat ready, maybe it's tens of terabytes, maybe it's hundreds of terabytes, even petabytes, um, then you can utilize a bulk upload service. Um, and again, for, for this example, we're looking at Amazon Web Services. And Amazon apps actually offer the, uh, the Snowball application and service. So you might be familiar with it, um, but for those who aren't, um, the Snowball is, uh, is a unit uh, that's sent out to you 
um, by Amazon via a courier. Um, it has an 80 terabyte storage limit on it, um, and you can use the AWS transfer tool to actually load your content onto the Snowball. Uh, you then send it off to AWS. The, the unit's got a um, an LCD screen, but you can actually put, you know, press a button, send it back to put the address for Amazon, and the carrier will come and pick it up, uh, take it back to Amazon's data centers. Um, and Amazon will actually work with your digital preservation solution provider to actually securely store uh, your content in the cloud. Now, if you do decide to utilize secure cloud storage, um, there's got to be some further consideration uh, for actually how you want to use your content. Uh, and therefore, the types, you know, that's going to impact the type of storage that you require. So, again, using Amazon Web Services as an example, um, Amazon provides a, a low cost Glacier option um, that it can be used to store larger files, so your TIFF files, uh, um, and it, it does have slower retrieval times, um, but this is maybe an option for, for preservation um, for preservation files and formats. Um, but if you need quick access, uh, then there's the more expensive uh, but low latency option of Amazon's S3, um, and, and you could use this for, for your presentation copies. So just then kind of the last piece to this and a further consideration um, is actually you know ensuring your content is accessible um, and that you've got the ability to share it. You know, you've spent this time and effort on, on getting your content uh, digitized and then, you know, ingested into a, a preservation system or, 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 an, or an equivalent. Um, and you may want to share it either internally across your organization um, or possibly with the public as well. Um, and, you know, you really don't want to be locking that valuable content away in a dark archive and just forgetting about it. You really don't want to take that approach. And I think, you know, if you want to unlock the value of, of your content, um, then controlled access uh, uh, with search capability is, is essential. Uh, and you're going to find that any good digital preservation solution uh, will provide this functionality. Now, in, you know, in some states, there's actually a legal mandate to uh, provide public access to state records. I'm sure you're aware of that. And you probably actually heard maybe previously Jelaine Chubb um, at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission uh, talking about this subject previously. Um, but you know, by having a public access site, uh, Jelaine and the team at Texas actually able to preserve their content, uh, store it securely, and more importantly, make it accessible to the public and, and meeting that state mandate and requirement. So, and you can actually see in the middle of the screen there, just uh, that's the Texas um, State Library and Archives uh, Universal Public Access site, which they've fully customized. Uh, Preservica sits behind it, um, and it's a great resource for the team down there in Texas and for the public. Okay, so I did say it would just be a few minutes, so that is it from me. So I'm going to pass pass on back to Bonnie. Okay. Who's wrap up for us today. Okay. Great. Thanks, David. Um, we do have some time for questions, and you can ask questions by typing them into the chat box on your screen. While we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our presenters and COSA and Preservica for making this webinar possible. I would also like to encourage all of you uh, to complete the survey that will pop up on your computer screen when this webinar ends. Um, it takes only a couple of minutes to do uh, the survey, and the survey results really help us understand how well we're doing, where we can improve, and also uh, will help us plan future webinar offerings. So any questions? Okay. 
not seeing anything, um, we'll wait just a little while longer. I uh, just wanted to let you know that if you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning with a question that suddenly popped into your head, please feel free to get in touch with us. Just go to www.statearchivists.org, click on the Contact Us link, and submit your question. We'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Okay, um, still not seeing any questions. Um, as I said, if one pops into your mind later, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, I think we're going to wrap things up here, and I hope you all have a good afternoon.